Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of our digital series on sustainability. My name is John Miller, president of Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center, or MSDC, a registered charitable organization located at the Muskoka Wharf in Gravenhurst. Our organization adopted sustainability as a core theme over a year ago, as another step in our evolution to develop a vibrant, excuse me, a vibrant cultural hub for the district of Muskoka. MSDC has adopted the slogan, Love Muskoka, Sustain Muskoka, Discover Ways to Make a Difference as a branding statement for our sustainability initiative. Our goal is for MSDC to become the physical and digital presence for community organizations and partners to encourage the will to act against climate change and to help Muskokans and visitors to this beautiful region of Ontario discover how they too can make a difference. Last week, we had over 150 participants in our first webinar and tonight we had 145 at last count. So we're thrilled at that level of community engagement. Now, please welcome Kevin Boyle, climate change, co climate change coordinator for the District of Muskoka and the moderator for our series to introduce tonight's speakers. Kevin, over to you. Well, thanks very much, John. And good evening, everyone. And welcome to the second installment of the Muskoka Steamship and Discovery Center, Love Muskoka, Sustain Muskoka speaker series. As John mentioned, my name is Kevin Boyle and I'm the Climate Change Initiatives Coordinator with the District of Muskoka. And we're proud to partner with the Muskoka Steamship and Discovery Centre and our other partner organizations to develop this series. Tonight's talk is all water. But before we get into that, I'll just do a little bit of administration and housekeeping. Uh, for our talks today, you'll notice at the bottom in the centre of your screen, we have a dedicated Q&A section. If you have any questions, please put your questions in there, but make sure you take a second to read the questions that are already in that box. You can vote up uh, with a little thumb or like button um, any question you see in there uh, and they will move to the top and we'll try to answer those in order. It'll also help us uh, eliminate the duplication of questions, making sure that we can get to the questions that everyone really wants answered. So uh, for tonight's speakers, we are very fortunate to have uh, two local talents, um, Kevin Trimble, uh, who is the former chair of the Muskoka Watershed uh, Shed Council. Kevin and his wife moved permanently to Muskoka seven years ago after three generations of his family cottaging on Lake Simcoe. He's semi-retired, although anyone who knows him knows that's questionably retired, maybe not retired, ecologist. Um, uh, and over the course of his 33 year career, he was involved in the private and public sector projects in ecology and land use. He's conducted projects in almost every sector in Ontario, including public infrastructure, mining, energy, land development, natural heritage strategy, and ecological restoration. He's one of the eight member Muskoka Watershed Advisory Group, which recently made its recommendation to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks on integrated watershed management. Also in the first talk is Dr. Richard Lammers. Richard Lammers is a member of the Watershed Council and also a research assistant professor in Earth Studies Research Center at the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans and Space at the University of New Hampshire. He focuses on understanding the dynamics of global and regional scale hydrology with an emphasis on human interactions within the hydrologic cycle. His recent efforts have included integrating models across multiple disciplines and exploring methods uh, to quantify resilience and vulnerability of the water, land, food, and energy systems. And with that, I will turn it over uh, to Kevin Trimble and Dr. Richard Lammers for their presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of Richard and myself, we'd like to um, thank thank you all for the uh, the invitation. We're excited to be a part of the webinar series, and and uh, you know we're all in this together. And our our hope is uh, we will all increase our understanding together um, as we move into the future. Um, this title could have been written as uh, "What's the difference between water management and watershed management?" Because uh, that's really what we'd like to um, to talk about. We're hearing a lot of, about both terms uh, nowadays. And with all the concern around um, flooding, it's easy to forget that water is a part of an ecosystem too. Um, some of you may have uh, seen the provincial announcements over the last few weeks about the $4 million on watershed initiatives 
Um, as as uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, uh, several of us, including uh, uh, John Miller, are members of the water uh, the watershed advisory committee, and the Muskoka Watershed Conservation and Management Initiative. Um, is geared towards finding more comprehensive ways to manage the entire watershed. Um, but many people might ask, how is that different uh, from what we do now? And there's a lot of confusion between the terms water management, uh, which we do now, and watershed management. So we're going to spend some, uh, some time talking about what we do now, a different way of looking at how water moves through the entire watershed, um, and why we should be concerned about all of the ecological um, processes in the watershed uh, ecosystem if we just want to alter one piece of it. <clears throat> so what we do now um, is water management, not watershed management. And water management has largely focused on trying to predict and manage water uh, after it's already gotten into our big rivers and lakes. But the, the watershed um, is made up of the entire landscape area that receives water and drains it to an outlet. Um, it includes not only the, the main river channels and the, and the big lakes, but also the entire land base with small streams and wetlands. And we have a vast capillary network um, of little headwater tributaries that might be one of the, the most understudied aspects of the Muskoka watershed. And all of these little rivulets um, play a role in capturing and holding water and moving, moving water to vegetation communities and to bigger streams. Um, our watershed is more than 80% covered by natural vegetation and a lot of that is forests. And the Ministry of Environment uh, Dorset Research Group has said that roughly half of our annual precipitation um, is sent back to the atmosphere by forest trees through evapotranspiration. So that's a lot of water that our forests are actually managing for us. I want to stop here and uh, stop sharing my screen so that Richard can come in and talk about um, what's happening now and how we look at water in the big rivers and lakes. Um, and then he's also going to help us understand a little bit more about how water actually moves through the broader watershed landscape. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I assume everyone can see my slides all right. Um, I, I also wanted to show some uh, uh, flood slides from uh, two years ago, April 2019. Um, these uh, pictures are from uh, Bracebridge, and uh, you can see that uh, for, those of, for those of us that were here in this area, we certainly experienced um, uh, flooded boathouses, uh, submerged streets. In fact, um, this picture that you see in the, on the top, uh, most of that water is sitting over top of a roadway. There's only a little bit of river up here in the corner. Um, we also saw uh, that, that dams were, were having water flowing over the top of them. And, um, and this, is, this has caused a, a lot of discussion around, uh, around Muskoka regarding these floods and, and how to manage this. And uh, what I wanted to do was to first talk about just the, the watershed itself. Um, this is a map of the Muskoka, Muskoka River watershed. And you can see up, up here in the east on the uh, right hand side is Algonquin Park where the headwaters of the two main tributaries are. And those tributaries are the north branch of the Muskoka River that uh, flows through Huntsville, Port Sydney towards Bracebridge and the south branch that flows through uh, Lake of Bays, Baysville to Bracebridge. The two rivers come together. Um, in Bracebridge, they flow into Lake Muskoka. Um, there's further uh, water that enters Lake Muskoka from uh, Lake Rosso and Lake Joseph and their uh, drainage basins, their sub-basins. And from Lake Muskoka, the water drains out through uh, the falls at Bala, and it uh, diverges into two channels that then flow to Georgian Bay. Um, and of course, from there, you're in the Great Lakes, which then flows to the St. Lawrence, Lawrence and out, out to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, now, uh, the, uh, the Ontario government and federal government maintain a, a database of river discharge. And these are two examples, the two best examples of river flow um, in the north, north branch for Port Sydney, which is the, uh, the graphic on the left and uh, the gauge at Baysville on the right. Now, if we look at those two as close-ups, these are the same, the same uh, graphics. What we're seeing 
is the daily water flow uh, past these two points where these gauges are and uh, over the full period of record that we have. Um, and we're very fortunate because at Port Sydney, we've got over, over a hundred year record. And at uh, Baysville, uh, you can see how the, the station was started a little bit later than uh, the North Branch. It was, it was put in somewhere around the early 40s. Uh, but you also notice that there's a, a multi-year gap in, uh, in the data set here. Now, I don't know if it pertains to this particular gauge, but I do know that um, around the mid to late 90s, uh, as a result of uh, multiple uh, budget cuts by uh, federal and provincial governments, that a lot of gauges were closed. So I suspect what you're seeing here is uh, the result of budget cuts and uh, we're actually missing data um, as a result. Um, most of the peaks that we see uh, throughout this whole time series, most of these are going to be the spring snowmelt. And, uh, but you can see there's a very high variability. If we now uh, zoom in on both of these gauges, the North Branch, uh, the Muskoka River, and the South Branch on the bottom, we're, we're looking at just the time series from 2009 to 2019. Um, the uh, Environment Canada has not released the 2020 data yet, as far as I know, when I checked uh, last month. Um, but you can see some of, some of the, uh, the finer details in these, in these hydrographs, and, we, and as hydrologists, we refer to these as hydrographs. Um, first of all, you can see that the, this large peak over on 2019 uh, for both gauges was uh, a record year. Um, that was the 2019 floods, but you can also see there was very high flow in 2013. And uh, several other years had pretty high flows as well. But what you can also see is, for instance, the summer of 2012, it, the uh, flows went very low um, at, at uh, both sites. And I know that um, when uh, in the summer of 2012, I remember being in the North Branch um, River and floating there and realizing that I wasn't actually moving downstream on that particular day, or it was very, very slow. So you can, we can get uh, droughts where we get very, very little flow. Uh, so now we're just looking at the North Branch. And, uh, and here I just wanted to look at the, the very highest ones. So I arbitrarily drew uh, a dashed line at 200 meters cubed per second um, to, just, to just focus on the, on the higher flows. And, and when we think about 200 meters cubed per second, what that means is at that site on that day, um, they determined, um, the, the, the folks that measure this, the, the discharge, that every second you had 200 meters cubed. Now you can imagine a meter by one meter by one meter as a cube. Every second, 200 of those went flowing by. This is a pretty fast rate. Uh, we can see from here that, um, that 2019 was a record uh, compared to the entire uh, period. And the prior record was actually from 1928, where they estimated it to be about 228 meters cubed per second. Um, now, I want to look at uh, uh, one way that, that we can look at uh, sort of the overall behavior by looking at the statistics of the flow. So um, if we just focus on this dark blue line, uh, we can see that what, what this is, it's the average for each day. So for example, today is April 29th which is somewhere close to here, we can see that if we take all of the April 29th from that time series that I just showed you and took their average, then it would plot uh, right here near the, near the end of April. And we do that for every single day. And we can see that yes, as we know that in the spring, the flows on average are much higher than the rest of the year. But it's also interesting to note that in November, we're also seeing a small peak and that's related to um, a lot of the increased precipitation we get um, in, the, in the fall. The, uh, the light blue line at the top is actually the maximum value for any given day. So all of these will be uh, daily records. And uh, this peak right here, we're, we're seeing uh, the 2019 flood. So, so here is a, in red, I've just added not the statistics, but the actual time series um, of the uh, 2019 flood. And what's, what's interesting is that we can see that in the first half of April, the flows were actually below average. And by mid-May, we saw that the flow had actually returned to close to the average. So what we find is that, that with these large floods, um, you're actually getting a compression of a lot of the snow melt and, uh, and rain. Usually it requires both to get these really big uh, floods. 
and it all happens at once, and then it, uh, then it winds down again. Now I want to switch gears from monitoring and just looking at the river to start uh, focusing in a little bit more on what Kevin uh, touched on about how uh, watershed management is really about the whole landscape and, and the rivers and the lakes. So uh, this, this slide is just to remind you that there's this water cycle, this global water cycle where we have these huge oceans, two thirds of the land surface, water is evaporating up into the atmosphere that moisture is carried in the atmosphere over the land and then it rains and snows down onto the land where it accumulates, it goes through a number of processes, gets into groundwater, gets into soil water and comes back to the oceans uh, through the rivers. Now, uh, locally, when we think about this, we may view the, uh, the landscape as a, as a hill slope uh, that, that connects the, all of the land to the stream flow. And you've got all of these different processes occurring through forests and fields. You've got wildlife, you've got wetlands, there's groundwater, there's glacial history uh, piled on top of that. And you take a bunch of these hill slopes, oh, wrong way, you take a bunch of these hill slopes and they merge into sub watersheds. And uh, here's uh, uh, the, uh, the Muskoka River with, uh, all, as well with Severn River and the Lower Black River, which aren't ex explicitly part of uh, Muskoka River. And they, uh, they form into a series of sub-basins which are connected into the larger basins. And, and these form this complex landscape that, that create this overall uh, watershed. Now there's one other uh, item that we need to think about and that's really the human component. And, and it has two scales. At the local scale, humans go in and they change the land, they impound rivers by building dams. Uh, they create uh, towns and cities through urbanization. They, they introduce uh, pollutants of all different sorts, including plastics, into the landscape. But there's also uh, a larger scale uh, human component where humans are changing the overall climate, which is driving changes in temperature and precipitation. The economy is having certain, creating certain for forces on the uh, watershed. And then how we manage that and how we educate people about it will make a difference on how we treat the landscape and, and how that is expressed in the overall river flow. Now there's another way of viewing the landscape. So the work that I do often uh, involves hydrological modeling. And there are many different types of hydrological modeling depending on what sort of questions you're asking about the system. But, uh, but the way that we do it, um, and the way many people do it, is we take that watershed and we drop a, 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 a matrix on it a, a, and create a series of grid cells, these boxes, and they can be any size. Now, uh, for a watershed of this size, typically we would have, you know, maybe thousands to tens of thousands of grid cells. Uh, so this is just a, a, a very crude diagram. And, uh, and then in any one of those grids, grid cells, or, or those grid cells, we have a representation of how each of those are connected to each other. And that, that's expressed in this middle diagram here, uh, where we in the model can see how those grid cells deliver water to the next grid cell and it keeps moving downstream. And then within any one of these grid cells, we then uh, can view all of the different processes that are occurring or all the major processes, how much precipitation there is, that's rain or snow, uh, what's the temperature, is there a snowpack? Is it melting? Does the water go into the root zone? Do, do the, does the vegetation take that water and transpire it back to the atmosphere? There's also uh, components of water use and uh, deep water in the aquifers or the, or the shallow water and that water gets into the river system and moves downstream. Okay, last slide. So the take home message from some of this is that uh, we really need to view the watershed as this integrated system. You can see this, uh, this uh, graphic here, which is uh, from the GeoHub that you'll hear about a little bit later uh, in this talk from uh, Graham. Uh, this is a 2019 air photo, and it happens to be just uh, west of the Bracebridge uh, developed area. And uh, we can see the, uh, the, the Muskoka River, water, uh, uh, River right here, but we can see there are forests, there are, there are pastures, there's development, uh, residential and commercial. There's a golf course here, water treatment plant. So the landscape is very complex. There's a lot of interactions happening all over the landscape. And now we'll go back to Kevin um, to uh, where he will start talking about some of the ecology and I will stop sharing and uh, send it back. Uh, 
Uh, hopefully I've got myself back here. Looks good, Kevin. Yeah, I just need to get my page turning done here. It's, hang on, I'm gonna unfreeze for a sec, unshare for one second. <clears throat> And now I will share. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, thanks, good. Richard. <clears throat> um, so when looking out at, at the watershed, as R Richard described it, um, uh, when you combine all of the natural infrastructure um, in the Muskoka River watershed, um, which includes like uh, the forest resources, wetlands, these small tributaries, um, every patch of land with soil, uh, and even our urban stormwater ponds and parks and waterfront properties. Um, there's a lot of features that we could look at differently for their potential functions in helping us to manage uh, water. And we really need to understand how the whole watershed works to get at this. So instead of treating um, symptoms like big flood flows um, in the main rivers, we could utilize the entire watershed um, to understand more about the causes um, and new solutions at the source uh, for that. And we really need to, to have that extra knowledge um, or we won't know what kind of flood infrastructure to build or how big um, or where. <clears throat> the Muskoka River watershed um, is about 5,100 square kilometers, but only about 15% of it or 780 square kilometers is made up by um, lake area, according to um, a white paper on water management that uh, was recently published by the Watershed Council. Um, and I'll show you the link for that um, at the end. Um, and so far we've been talking about a different way to look at, look at water management, um, but there's a lot more to manage than, than just water on its own here. Um, presumably, we all want to protect the high quality environment we have um, in, Mus in Muskoka. Um, and there's a lot of increasing pressures um, on the watershed right now, including climate change and its effects on, on temperatures and weather patterns, increasing pressure, pressures to pull the trigger on um, uh, flood mitigation measures or single measures uh, without necessarily knowing their full consequences and increasing pressures from land and waterfront development. Um, but right now we don't really manage the watershed as a single unit. Um, we've got it divided up into four upper tier governments, including Muskoka, Perry Sound, Halliburton and Nipissing and 13 separate um, local municipalities. And they're all doing their best to, to keep a focus on valued um, environmental assets, um, but they have a lot of issues in their own jurisdictions and they don't necessarily have um, a good watershed lens or perspective um, to look from. Um, and, and, and why would they? Well, it, 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 why would they want to? Well, it turns out um, that since a watershed is a, is a defined geographical area, um, Watershed uh, ecologists can under the ecologists can use that to understand more about the physical and biological components um, of of that geographical unit, and so the watershed has become widely accepted in most parts of the world um, as a convenient ecosystem size um, to use for land use planning as well as uh, water management. And if we look at the building blocks um, of an ecosystem. You've got atmospheric um, inputs and climate, uh, climate um, which gives us part of our, our water cycle, our weather patterns and, and our air quality, et cetera. And then there's a bunch of um, geologic components and they, they give us um, the shape of the landscape and our valleys, rock types um, that, that produce geochemical uh, processes that build soils um, and combined with climate dictate what can grow here. Um, and all of these elements support our microbial um, plant and wildlife habitats and, and communities. And we've got them in a package so we can, we can measure, measure them and understand the, the linkages and interactions between them. And what I'd like to focus on next um, is that if, if we make changes to any one piece of the system, 
all of the other pieces are somehow going to change or be affected. Um, not only um, like big changes from the top down, um, but also from subtle changes from the bottom up. And one of the most obvious recent examples of the bottom up change, um, as we're learning now, even in this webinar series, um, is what's happening on the ground has an ecological effect um, that's producing a massive shift in, in climate that, that, is, that is now trickling back down through to the living, living environment um, for us here. Um, another example is uh, that vegetation can modify the physical structure um, of, of a watershed ecosystem in a whole bunch of ways. So, um, through evapotranspiration and moving water, through holding stream banks and playing a big role in channel forms and floodplains, um, by locking up nutrients uh, and cycling nutrients, um, building soils and providing food and habitat for many insect and, and wildlife um, communities. So if we modify the vegetation um, in a particular valley or in a, in a corner of the watershed, there are going to be physical changes um, in the way water moves through the watershed and many other components of the system can be, can be altered or destabilized. Um, ecologists working on climate change often use uh, um, an example of how uh, one small wetland changes. If the temperature goes up slightly, we can, we can um, get evaporative losses um, with changes in hydro period, which is how long the wetland is inundated for, um, from erratic weather patterns. Um, these um, can alter uh, the natural uh, plant emergence and community stability. Um, and then we get physical changes um, in, in, the, in the actual structure of, of the wetland, which can end up altering flow patterns throughout the watershed. And then imagine if that happens to hundreds or thousands of these small wetland pockets over the same period of time in a single watershed. So the watershed is operating like a, a complex web of interactions um, and it's hard or near impossible to manage or change one piece without having uh, effects um, in, in the rest of the system. Kevin Boyle suggested um, this, uh, that I use this lake example, um, which is from one of our Watershed Council uh, articles that went into um, MuskokaRegion.com recently and is now um, being used, uh, I believe, over across Halliburton. Um, and this one is about what could happen to an ecosystem if we make a mistake um, artificially adjusting um, lake water levels. The near, shore, uh, the near shore bed of the lake is called the littoral zone and it goes from the shore down to about as far as light can penetrate. Um, and this is a, an oversimplified example. Um, but if you, if you imagine that that light blue band is the littoral zone, um, that band might shift up and down a bit over the year um, as water levels in an unregulated lake go up and down um, with, the, with the seasons. And the, the ecosystem uh, has adopted to this shifting band for many processes that end up maintaining biological communities and water quality and water clarity. And in fact, many shoreline wetlands on, on especially big lakes um, depend on this shift uh, seasonally for root zones and seeds to prepare for the, um, uh, the, the coming year. Uh, species like lake trout um, spawn in the late fall in littoral areas that have very specific slopes and depths and substrates and wave action. And their eggs hatch in the late winter, early spring period. Um, and this species in particular uh, uh, is, is very particular about returning to the same spot every year. So if we dropped um, lake levels right after spawning too far, um, the eggs from the species would be left high and dry and we can end up impacting the population. Now the Muskoka River Water Management Plan has rules built into it um, to avoid um, stranding um, lake trout eggs. And this is kind of uh, uh, the indicator for overall environmental effects in the, in the, lake, in the water management plan. But many people are asking, um, what's the big deal if we drop lake levels a little bit more or a little bit earlier um, each year um, to prevent flooding. And who cares if we lose a few sport fish um, here and there? 
Well, it, it's, it's actually a, a bit more complicated than that. And as Jack Imhoff said at our stewardship conference uh, during the 2019 flood, um, complex problems have simple, easy to understand, but wrong um, answers. Um, it turns out that there are other species um, and, and groups of organisms and processes going on in the littoral zone. To start, um, there are other fish species like walleye, um, which can spawn along shorelines in the early spring and northern pike and muskie, which spawn in shallow weedy areas and wetlands. Um, and if we happen to pick the wrong time or extent uh, of water level change, um, their populations can be affected too. And these species aren't just sport fish, they're top predators in a, in a food web. Um, if their populations um, are shifted too much, um, there'd be trickle down effects throughout the, uh, throughout the community. Um, and just a, again, as an example, if, if, if their numbers drop radically, um, we could have a domino effect, um, starting for example, with a population ex explosion in their prey fish. Um, and if you have a lot more small fish, um, they would eat more tiny zooplankton and bugs, um, which are the grazers. And now that these, there are less grazers um, to consume algae and organic matter. So when this starts to happen um, in an extreme case, it starts to alter the biochemical uh, processes and the bottom part of the, uh, the food web in the littoral zone. And combined with pressures that are already coming at us from, from climate change, um, we can end up with more water quality problems or algal blooms as, as a result of, of, a, of a mistake on this front. Now, what I've been talking about is our artificial regulation of, of um, lake levels and our attempt to, to sort of manage um, floods. And I can think of three different scenarios um, for this. One, we could alter um, our usual drawdown cycle just once or once in a while. And the, the ecosystem processes I mentioned would probably get a jolt um, and, and uh, hopefully would recover or adjust to that. Um, a second one is we might more permanently change the annual drawdown cycle. Um, and that would force that literal, that light blue littoral zone band to permanently move um, further down the lake bed, deeper into the lake. And the ecosystem would have to permanently adjust um, to a potentially steeper slope or smaller surface area or different um, substrates or different wave, um, wave action. Um, and, a, and a more extreme scenario that could happen is we might alter our management regime um, based on political pressure whenever people get more worried about um, a coming flood year. Um, and this scenario could result in all kinds of, of different jolts to the ecosystem um, that it would have to recover from. And I'm not trying to be alarmist uh, in, in, in raising this, but I do wanna point out that um, it, it's not a simple matter of tweaking one element of an ecosystem for our own convenience and then assuming that all the other pieces um, uh, won't be affected. If we made a big mistake doing this, we could end up um, protecting some buildings from floods, but then have um, poor or unhealthy uh, water quality or clarity or more algal blooms in our, in our lakes. So the message here is that we really need to consider all of the pieces of an ecosystem when we wanna make a change to, to one of them. If we look at it through that watershed ecosystem lens, uh, we might actually find out that there's a way to achieve what we want um, while also protecting the, um, the ecosystem components that we value. <clears throat> and one final example, um, if you do a YouTube search, uh, you, can, you can find uh, probably a number of different videos on this, um, searching on wolf reintroduced to Yellowstone Park or something like that. I can't remember the link for this exact one. Um, there's a number of versions and they, they slightly oversimplify um, some, a few scientific um, details. Um, but this is still a good example of how um, a, a change to one species can, can affect the whole ecosystem. Um, and ecologists often have trouble um, finding good examples to articulate this. I can't show it here, but um, just, just to tell a quick, a quick story, um, they knew that their river systems in Yellowstone National Park were very destabilized in the valley bottoms um, before, but they had no idea that, it, that, that introducing wolf um, could fix rivers. 
And the story goes just really quickly like this. They reintroduced the wolves, um, which hunted over abundant deer and the deer population came down. Vegetation, uh, vegetative regeneration started with young forests um, with aspens and willows and shrubs that produce berries. That brought insects back um, to increasing levels, increased diversity of the bird community. Um, the young growth also brought um, beaver back, which created ponding and wetlands for species like otters, muskrats, and reptiles. Um, the wolves also killed, uh, killed off a lot of coyotes um, and, and rodents and rabbits uh, increased. These are just examples um, with predatory birds and ravens coming back. And all of this led to adjustments in predator prey balances um, and flood floodplain vegetation um, communities that ended up reducing erosion, tightening up river channels, um, improving uh, sediment transport processes in the, in the rivers, um, fixing and building new floodplains which hold back flood water, um, and, and, and backing up and locking up uh, sediment and, and nutrients. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a cool example. And I know it's, it's, it's a bit exaggerated um, in some details, but it's, it's, it shows how complex the feedback loops between biological and physical pieces of the ecosystem uh, really can be. And, and so the message again is we need to consider um, all of the connections and interactions between the pieces of an ecosystem um, when we want to make a change to one of them. Um, uh, and, and if we look at it through the watershed um, lens, we might find out that there's, that there's ways to um, accomplish what we need while protecting the, uh, uh, the whole system at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and this message applies um, um, not only to the examples I gave, but to you know, lake level management, um, land development, the ways in which we design uh, waterfronts at a large or small scale um, and decisions we make on what kind of infrastructure to build or where to do forestry or, or restoration projects as well. Um, and even some of our, um, our climate change solutions can be, can be probably better achieved if we think about that, that ecosystem scale of the watershed when we design them. So, how do we help municipalities and water managers um, and property owners um, put on that, that watershed ecosystem lens? Jack Imhoff put this in his presentation again at that, that um, stewardship conference. We, we cannot solve today's problems with the same level of thinking that created them. So watershed management um, is, a, is a process um, and it, that allows um, stakeholders and communities and government to come together um, and collaborate and coordinate their decisions on land use and water management across the entire um, watershed. Um, a watershed plan will help us uh, to, to better integrate um, many goals and consequences of our decisions. So we don't, we don't fix one thing at the expense of others and also to put um, local decisions um, into the context of the whole watershed um, because so many processes are operating at that watershed ecosystem scale. And the beauty of it is that it includes, it includes people. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not actually about environmentalism and it's not about, um, uh, it, or sorry, it, it, is, it is more about our, our communities and our, and our economies, um, not about, environmentalism uh, or constraining development or where um, infrastructure can be built. Um, it's about doing those things better. So we're addressing climate change goals and maintaining um, the environmental quality that, that we expect to have here in, in 20 or 30 years from now. But the real key um, for this discussion is that every, every land use we want to do um, whether it's at, at, at an individual property ownership level or at a subdivision level or, or whatever, um, we need to anticipate the ways um, in which the other parts of the ecosystem may be altered by those um, decisions or designs or, or actions. And the best way to, to anticipate that is by really looking at that ecosystem scale and all of the potential interactions um, that can happen. So I'm not going to go into detail on watershed planning today specifically, but just very quickly, um, the, 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 the basic, the basic um, steps in, in it 
are, are to look at how all of the pieces of the watershed um, fit together um, and how the whole system works. That's, that's at the top called characterizing the system. Um, coming up with, with shared goals, and that's the business community, um, as well as property owners and government, um, for how we want the watershed to be decades from now, um, as well as some measurable goals and actions um, so we can truly make um, integrated um, land use and water management decisions. Um, and then there's uh, sort of the goals and, and, and action plans in our decisions, and we implement those and, and look for um, gaps or mistakes or new or better information that might be needed um, as we continue to move through the process. So it's, it's a living uh, process and there's a living um, watershed strategy involved in it. And this, this has been um, used elsewhere in Ontario and it's been used um, all over North America and in Europe um, and even in third world countries. Um, but it's, it's, it's never been done in the Muskoka watershed before. And that's, that's one of the things that uh, many of us now would like to change in which the provincial government has provided funding through the watershed um, initiative for. So some of this information is on the, um, the MWC or Muskoka Watershed Council uh, website. Um, and the three, three specific papers being our 2016 climate change report, which I think that that cover page has been all over the place um, now. Um, a white paper on integrated watershed management and a more recent paper, which is a really, really excellent um, primer on um, water management and the water management plan um, by, uh, by Chris Craig, um, published uh, recently. So I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of uh, Richard and I, and uh, we're happy to take any questions. I think Kevin, we're gonna we're gonna hold questions to the end just so that we can make sure we get through all the the presentations. But I, I see a number of great questions coming into our Q and A section in the bottom, and so I'd encourage everyone to go in there, and you're able to put in your questions, but also you're able to upvote or like questions in there, and they'll move to the top, and we'll make sure we get to those first. Uh, but without further ado, I would love to. It's my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Wilson. Um, Rebecca Wilson is a water quality technician with the District of Muskoka, and or sorry, Rebecca Wilson is the water quality planning technician for the Muskoka Watershed Council and the District of Muskoka. She has a degree in zoology and a certificate in environmental conservation from the University of Wales, as well as a certificate in restoration ecology from Niagara College. Through her work with the district and the Muskoka Watershed Council, Rebecca is active in promoting good stewardship practices across our watersheds with an emphasis on maintaining good water quality uh, and it has some tools and tricks for us today. Uh, there you go, Rebecca. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin. I'm just gonna share my screen. So that was a excellent presentation by um, Richard and, and Kevin, and it's gonna be hard to follow that, but I will do my best. Um, I would like to thank the uh, Muskoka Steamship and Discovery Center for inviting me here today to speak. Um, the topic of being kind to Mother Nature is really one that I feel strongly about. And I'm hoping that by the end of the presentation, you'll share some of my um, passion and enthusiasm for healthy waterfronts. I only have about 10 minutes to speak, so I hope you don't mind if I just jump right in. So it likely comes as no surprise that our shorelines are under pressure. We all want to be close to water. And in fact, it's probably one of the main reasons many of us are in Muskoka in the first place. But the shoreline area is also one of the more sensitive areas in, in our watershed. And some of the challenges that our shorelines face include increasing development pressures, increasing population density, increasing resource use, decreasing wildlife habitat, and degrading water quality. Everything we do on our waterfront property can impact the health of our shoreline and in turn, the health of our water, our water. Add on top of all of those pressures that our shorelines were already facing, we now have climate change. Um, lakes and shorelines do not have an endless capacity to deal with the stresses that we put on them. And this capacity may be reduced further as climate change continues to manifest in a variety of ways. Things like rising water temperature, less ice cover, extreme weather events, and more variable lake levels can all have a, a compounding impact on some of the other stresses that our, our shorelines face.
So there are a number of simple actions that you as a, as a I mean, this, this presentation is geared towards waterfront property, but honestly, it's anyone who lives in the environment, in Muskoka especially. Um, there's a number of simple actions that you can take to be a good steward of your shoreline property. And I bet most of you are already taking um, some of them. So I do want, just wanted to include a couple of examples of simple lists, including Muskoka Watershed Council's Clean and Green 13 and Seguin Township's 12 Steps to Success. Being a good steward means doing the little things on your property that can add up to big results. For those of you looking for a more detailed resource, um, you can get a copy of Muskoka Watershed Council's uh, Living in Cottage Country Handbook um, for, for a small fee, and we're in the process of updating it to 2021. So we'll have um, updated versions available soon. I wanna bring your attention to the first point on this slide, keep your shoreline natural and enhance it if possible. This to me is the number one thing that you can do for your property as a, to protect your shoreline now and into the future. The remainder of this presentation is going to talk about why this is the number one action you can take and how to do it. For those of you who already have a pretty natural shoreline, congratulations, you're ahead of the curve. Hopefully the next few slides, I'll provide you with ample reason to ensure that you maintain that natural shoreline for now and into the future. You've probably been hearing for years that the single most important thing you can do to maintain or improve the health of your lake is to have a healthy and functioning shoreline buffer. If you've ever seen any presentations by me, um, then I know you've heard it because it's pretty much the one thing I say in every presentation I do. Uh, the bigger the better for shoreline buffer is, is awesome, but honestly, any little thing you can do is, is, a, is, is helpful and a good start. The, the reason you want a shoreline buffer is because it does help mitigate all the actions that you do on your cottage and on your property. It, it keeps it from impacting the lake and the water quality. So um, anything you can do to, to beef up your shoreline buffer or create it in the first place is going to have a, a pretty big impact on your lake. When we talk about the buffer area, we're talking about more than just a strip along the waterfront. All of the zones are important, not just for water quality, but also to protect your property during ex extreme weather events. The upland zone is usually where your cottage is located. This area tends to be higher and drier and with, has vegetation that takes advantage of the better drainage. The riparian zone is the transitional area between water and land uh, and vegetation in this area is adapted to changing and fluctuating water levels and can tolerate periods of flooding. The littoral zone, which you heard Kevin talk a bit about in the uh, previous presentation, um, begins at the water's edge and extends out to um, where sunlight can no longer penetrate to the lake bottom. This is where you'll find aquatic plants as well as all the organisms that form the basis of the food chain. This is the most important and productive habitat in the lake. Aquatic plants found in this uh, zone are often underappreciated. Besides providing food and shelter for a variety of wildlife species, they help stabilize loose sediment and help mitigate the impacts of waves on your shoreline. As we begin to realize how many different functions shorelines really have, it becomes clear that it's to our advantage to protect these areas and maintain healthy shorelines. So what exactly does a healthy shoreline look like? A healthy shoreline is full of vegetation and the more variety in the species and the more native versus non-native there are, the better. Remember, if there's one thing nature dislikes, it's a monoculture. So the days of having lawn right down to your water is, is hopefully over for most people. The healthier shoreline will increase as the number of different plants increases. A healthy shoreline will also have different levels of vegetation. Uh, everything from ground cover and grasses to ferns, plants, wildflowers, shrubs, and importantly, different ages of trees. I've seen quite a few properties that the, the landowners did a wonderful job of maintaining their mature trees, which is awesome to see, but they've cleared out a lot of the younger trees underneath. And, and um, our area has been hit by tornadoes every once in a while. And I've had landowners, um, you know, if a tornado comes through and tears out all your mature trees and they don't have any younger stock ready to sort of take advantage of the open skyline now and grow, um, then you're starting from square one. So it's always nice to have a, a variety of age, especially for your trees. In addition to all the plants, a healthy shoreline may have standing dead trees, 
fallen logs and different sizes of stones and rocks. All these components help to create structure and habitat for wildlife. And with all these rocks and vegetation, things may look a little bit wild to you, but remember that nature by definition is not neat and properly trimmed. The more plants and the more structure you have, the better it is. But there's also varying degrees of wild. You don't have to have um, a shoreline that is completely impassable to be healthy. By adding narrow pathways and by trimming tree branches and shrubs instead of removing them, you can create a wonderfully private retreat with a beautifully framed view of the water. Another good measure of the health of your shoreline is the amount of wildlife you find there, whether it's birds, fish, mammals, amphibians, or insects. Uh, wildlife will be attracted to areas where there's good habitat. So if you find lots of different wildlife on your shoreline, then you've created good habitat for them. Conversely, what does an unhealthy shoreline look like? It's one where the shoreline area has been cleared of, of most or all vegetation. In many cases, we see a lawn that extends right to the water or extends to a, a beach area. Um, often the natural shoreline will be, have been replaced with a hardened structure like a retaining wall or gabion baskets, or more commonly in Muskoka, we see uh, loose rock walls. Uh, unhealthy shorelines can lead to problems like uh, shoreline erosion, poor water quality, and it also provides awesome habitat for some of the nuisance wildlife species that you may not be too thrilled to see on your property, like Canada geese. Whether you currently have little or no shoreline buffer, you can start to improve this by simply doing nothing. It doesn't get simpler than that. Just do nothing. Stop mowing along the shoreline and watch the taller grasses, wildflowers, and ferns start to grow. Keep an eye on what is growing and be sure to remove anything that might be invasive or if there's a, a species growing that you're not a fan of, just remove it when it's young and, and easy to remove. Um, each year you can start to um, increase the amount of area that you're not mowing and gradually before you know it, you're going to have a pretty decently sized um, uh, shoreline buffer. It is a slow process. Um, you know, you'll start to see some of the herbaceous species come up the first year. Um, after a couple of years, you start to get more shrubs and trees um, and then they'll just keep growing up the more you leave it. Um, it is a slow process, but it is easy. For those of you who want to take a bit of a more active approach, you can always supplement your uh, natural growth with native trees and shrubs that you purchase and plant. Um, here's an example of one that we did on, I believe this one is on Stewart Lake in, um, uh, in Mac Tier. Um, you, so you can help speed up the process and that also helps you get a variety of ages within your um, shoreline area. And sometimes there are even programs that might help you um, help you get started on your renaturalization program. So how nice are you currently being to Mother Nature? There are a number of self-assessments you can do on your property that can highlight what you're doing well and also give you ideas for where you can improve. The Love Your Lake program offers a very simple, quick self assessment and I included the link here and I will add uh, links to some of these documents in the um, chat box for everyone later. Um, and if you want to do something that's a little bit more involved um, and detailed then Watersheds Canada has also released this lake protection workbook um, that is uh, quite detailed actually and gives you some really good tips, lets you know how almost grades you on, on how you're doing on your shoreline. Um, so all, all of these resources can give you ideas of, of what you're doing well and where you can improve. And I, I bet you'd be surprised at, at a lot of the little things that you're already doing on your property. Um, you know, they all add up. So wherever you can start or continue is, is definitely worth it. So I, I hope I stayed within my 10 minutes. Um, thank you for listening. And I just want to finish off with this photo by the late Rob Allen. Um, I love this picture. I can just picture myself sitting on that bench, watching the sunset, listening to, you know, the frogs calling and the birds flitting around in the trees above um, and just enjoying nature. Um, and to me, this is what living in Muskoka should be like. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that informative
a short, tight presentation, very informative, and some stuff we can do. And, uh, you know, I, I really like that. Doing nothing is the start, and then from there we can move up. I think that's really great. So thank you very much for your time. All right, moving on. Next, we have uh, Graham Good. Graham Good has been the manager of geomatics at the District of Muskoka for the past 19 years. Um, the District of Muskoka's geomatic department provides mapping support to all departments at the district uh, and each of the area mus uh, municipalities within Muskoka. The new Muskoka GeoHub web mapping site offers environmental planning and spatial information that may be used by municipal staff and of course, by the public. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Graham for his presentation. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to show you some tips and tricks on how to use the new Muskoka GeoHub site. I'll get right to it and I'll share my screen and everybody can see that. Perfect. So this is the site. Um, there's plenty of different maps that the public can have access to. And I'm going to focus on just a couple of them today. Um, I think for the most part, People are just going to start looking for a general map, and this, that would be the top topo map here, as it has most of the GIS layers uh, that we have presented and available to it. I just did a quick zoom out, and you could see the entire district of Muskoka. And I could zoom in by rolling my mouse wheel forward. And when I do that, you notice that we have a dynamic legend here. Uh, certain layers turn on when you zoom in, and if I zoom out, certain layers come off, and I could roll my mouse back to zoom out. Uh, here's a trick. If you're interested in zooming into a particular part, just move your mouse to that particular area and zoom in. It'll take you right to where you're pointing. And you'll see we have roads, we have buildings, we have property fabric, we have contour lines. And if I zoom in one last time, we have the 911 civic addresses. So lots of information available on this map. If I click and hold my mouse, I could drag and center my map exactly where I want it. So we have a dynamic legend, but we also had to have an interactive website. Interactive meaning that you could turn layers on and off if you don't want to see it. Or if you want to be more specific, you could ex actually expand these boxes and say, I don't want to see the building footprints. And you could turn that off specifically. So we could turn layers on and off. Um, we also have the ability with this new version to quickly find layers uh, from the air photos. So this base map gallery allows you to pick the latest version of the air photos the 2018 and click it so boom it's on um, hopefully not all 150 of us are doing this exactly at the same time but okay um, so you can see the air photos we also have historic air photos you can click the button to go back to 2013 all the way back to 1987 and if you're interested 1969 or back to the general base map to start over again. Uh, there's a lot of information that is behind the data. All you need to do is click on anything and it'll have one of these pop-ups show up. This is just general information that we have on all the properties, which we've been showing for the last decade. Um, but when you see this more information link, click it. You're gonna get a lot more information. Uh, in this particular case, we have a street view where we could actually see the 911 civic addresses, which we use for 911 civic addressing. <clears throat> the other thing that this has is the ability to do really detailed searches. So you could click this button, you could search for your property fabric roll number or your civic address. You could get close with a road name or a lake or even a specific island. So you could do some quick searches using the search tool. We also have the ability to mark up this map or these maps or draw on it. So I could type note, I could change the, the color, I could change the size and I could put it on my map. I could draw a polygon, I could pick the style and I could even pick the perimeter of what we wanna be able to show it as. And now I'm gonna draw my nice new house right beside the railway station. We could also have all these other tools, but this one has the points and there's literally thousands of these where you could pick and customize it and you could put your own uh, note on it and you could even put the coordinates to show the X, Y coordinates of that. So once you've set it up, you could actually print this. You could go to the print tool, 
you can uh, click in this and follow all the default settings, but you could change the title and print it and save it as a PDF map and share it. Okay. So there's some quick tools there on how to use the basic map. But the latest and greatest map that we have is this flight, floodline and LIDAR mapping. And we've made some recent changes to it. Um, if you zoom into it, you'll be able to see these new water level stations. And if you click on one of these, it will give you the current water level, uh, 9.54 meters. And you could also see the historical differences and changes, um, the, the historical maximum and minimums. But it's this one here that we want to show about. This is the difference from the daily average level. Uh, and this value represents the color that we see in the legend. So today it's a yellow, but tomorrow or the next week it might go up to this dark blue. And there's a lot more other information in this pop-up. At the bottom, it tells you the day that it's and time it's last refreshed and updated, which happens every day. Um, and we're getting this data from the source, um, from the geo, uh, geo service. So this is being changed and updated automatically every day. We don't have to make that change. But if I click this link, it'll take us to their site and you could actually see the live up to the minute every five minutes values for the water levels at this particular station. You could zoom out and pan over and you could see the historical information on that particular site or all of these sites. Okay. Um, what we've done though is we've, we've kind of taken it another level because this current water level doesn't really mean a lot to people directly. And what we've done is we've applied this conversion factor to create a value in meters per meters above sea level. So now when people look at this, they click 225.49, but when they click their property, they're actually getting a corresponding land elevation that relates to this new value, which is 225.7 in this particular spot that I clicked. That's the land elevation <clears throat> according to the LIDAR data, which means this property is dry today, but maybe not tomorrow. Um, if I click this next feature, <clears throat> what it'll take us to is the actual lake, lake static elevation for this lake, which is shown up in this legend here, which is 226. So this line highlighted has an elevation of 226.7 around it. And you could click more information to call up the PDF maps as well. We could also search and find actual other, other levels, uh, water level stations. And this one happens to be on a river, which has the current level again. But when you scroll down, you'll be able to see the actual um, cubic meters per second on each one of these and the historical values as well. More information at the bottom and more links are available too. But while I have you here, I thought I would show one more cool thing that we've um, done for these sites. <clears throat> I could turn on my air photo <coughs> and I could click this tool here. This is our swipe tool. And what we're able to see is the standard view I think a lot of us have seen on the air photos. But if I drag this over, we're actually seeing through the trees, through the vegetation, to what the ground looks like on the DTM, which is kind of cool. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the end of my time. Um, I, I do suggest or ask that you kind of come back and take a look at some of these other cool maps that we have. Um, but how to find us? <clears throat> There's a couple quick ways to be able to find the Muskoka GeoHub. In your Chrome, Firefox, or Edge browsers, you could type this map.muskoka.on.ca um, URL in, or you could do a Google search for Muskoka GeoHub. But I think a better way would go to the District of Muskoka web page, website, which is muskoka.on.ca. You'll see tons of really interesting information that all of the District of Muskoka employees are doing every day. Or, or you could click on the area municipality bucket and here you could see the map tab, which will take you to the GIS hub page, which is really cool. And you'll be able to see some previously recorded helpful inf information sessions here. Uh, and you could also launch to the GeoHub uh, site by clicking that. And there is a another help video here. You can get some more uh, special hip, tips and tricks that I didn't have time for you today by watching that video. So that's all the time I had for you today. I'd be happy to hear your comments, your suggestions, 
or any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Graham. I really thought it was, was cool how this presentation started with a talk on water levels and, and Dr. Lammers got into some of those graphs and it links all the way in the end to where we can link to those graphs and get the real-time water levels along with Rebecca's tips and tricks on being nice to our shorelines and, and the environment. So now we'll, um, we'll turn it over to some questions and I see we've got a lot of great questions here. And so we'll, um, we'll take questions sort of in order, but we'll also make sure that we split them out uh, between the different speakers so that we can all get a, get a chance to get um, our questions answered. So uh, to start with uh, the first question we have, um, how do we ensure that development does not overpower the natural infrastructure so that there's sufficient infrastructure going forward? Um, and I know that Kevin Trimble had indicated that he'd like to take the first crack at this. Uh, so I would turn that over to Kevin Trimble. Yeah, hi, and thanks for the question, Daryl. Um, yeah, I thought, I, I thought maybe I could, I could sort of combine um, your question with um, the one that Randall, Randall asked about um, uh, flooding. And are we are we ever going to be able to get a get a handle on flooding <laughs> as well? But on 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 land land development, um, the the idea with with the watershed management planning is that um, if we if we have a good handle on how all of the parts of the watershed work, um, we would be able to establish um, multidisciplinary um, measurable goals for. Um, all of our communities or sub watersheds, and and that would that would allow us. So if you if you were going forward with with a particular land use project, um, we we would know a little bit more about not only minimizing the effects of that project on the ecosystem or the flood regime or whatever, but we would also be able to um, have guidance um, for achieving that that projects goal while at the same time achieving climate change goals, ecological goals and water management goals. And so it, it, it really takes each corner of, of the watershed and, and tries to set um, some land use goals and a few new ground rules. So it, it, and the, the, the goal, the, the, the objective is not to say um, no more development or no more construction of a certain type, but that there's, there's, a, there's a few additional considerations on how to do it so it achieves other, other goals. And so I think I think your 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 question is we this where we get into the flood part of this. Um, nat, there's natural infrastructure and there is built infrastructure um, in the watershed for managing uh, floods. And um, if we do our job right and, and inventory all of the resources in the watershed, we'll have a better idea of um, the the blends of 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 both that will uh, give us the biggest bang for the buck. And and if if we don't if we don't do um, some form of watershed planning, and somebody wants to go and build um, a flood mitigation structure somewhere, it's kind of like putting a blindfold on and throwing a dart at a dartboard, um, because we we really need to, to to have some information available to us to know what to build, where to build it, and how big to to build it. And another thing I, I wanted to mention, uh, and getting more to, to Rand Randall's um, question, is that flooding is a part of the natural process. Um, I've been in talks like this where people actually asked, why can't we just stop any flood water from coming down? <laughs> and so floods are going to happen. And no matter what we do with, with management, we're still going to have floods. And one of, the, one of the challenges in the Muskoka watershed is that we um, have uh, made ourselves some allowance to build in areas that may be prone to, to flooding at, at some point in the future. And we need tools like uh, the new Muskoka um, floodplain mapping to identify those areas so people can figure out what their risk is if they want to uh, um, build. Um, but we, we have no infrastructure in the Muskoka River watershed that was designed and built for flood management. And that, to, that comes as a big surprise to people because of all the dams, but our dams and our water man, management plan um, were not designed for, for flooding. And, and so we're, we're at ground zero if we wanted to look for the best places, the best co cost benefit ratios and the best ecological objectives if we, if we wanted to build something somewhere to, uh, to manage um, floods as we, as we go forward. I'll stop there, Kevin. 
Thank you very much, Kevin. Two, two Kevins can get complicated, but we'll, we'll make it work there. Um, all right, so I, I guess sort of um, this question follows along with that question. So what role do Muskoka residents play in helping manage our watershed? Uh, and, and maybe I would um, I would turn that to 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 all of them, to, to Rebecca, to Dr. Lammers, or to Graham or, or Kevin. So, so what is our role? What is the average Muskokan's role uh, in, um, in helping I, manage our watershed? I, I can take a, a very brief shot at that. And, and my first thought is, is get involved. Um, we, you know, understand the problem better, help other people in the community understand the problems uh, that we have and, and that we're facing. And uh, one of the best ways to do it is, is through the Muskoka Watershed Council. Uh, it's a group of volunteers that are trying to understand what's happening in this watershed and, uh, and to identify the problems. They get together, they write reports, they re release them to the community, and they've got a, a strong communications group that is also trying to uh, send this information out there. Thanks. That's great. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, and we do have some email questions here as well, so I want to make sure we spread them amongst the panelists. Um, so for uh, Mr. Good, um, I noticed that you had live lake levels for some of the major lakes. Um, are you looking to expand on your lake level mapping uh, with the GeoHub tool? Yes, we are. Uh, great question. Uh, we've received uh, that live uh, link from NRCAN, but we are working with um, our local MNRF uh, staff to be able to add many more additional water uh, level stations to the map. Um, it's um, hopefully simple and easy, but yes, we hopefully expand the 15 that we currently have in Muskoka to many more than that in the next days or weeks to come. That's excellent. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, and so I guess this would be open to all panelists, um, and I think maybe there'd be different perspectives, but would the panelists have an idea on how to propel these messages uh, forward uh, and to stimulate change? Uh, and, and I will, before I ask them to answer, I will do a, a shameless plug for next week's session uh, in which we have Aaron Rusak with the um, Soka Conservancy as well as Dr. Ellen Field from Lakehead University. And they'll be talking about ecology as well as a little bit of how education plays into that. So look forward to that next week. But I see Kevin Trimble has turned on his camera, so I will turn it over to him. <laughs> I'll take one really quick quick crack. I, I think it's, it starts uh, with venues just like the one we're in right now. Um, I think I think we all need to be coming together and talking and getting on the same level of education about all of this stuff as much as we can. Uh, we need and we need to um, make it uh, a priority with our local government um, and councillors. And I know there's at least a few councillors um, on this this webinar tonight. Thank thanks to those guys for for coming in, um, and and uh, to to Richard's point from earlier, um, getting involved with the uh, Muskoka Watershed Council and other uh, other groups that are doing this because we're pushing the agenda. Um, we have to create a body to do this. We don't have a conservation authority in Muskoka right now. And uh, we need a body that represents the entire watershed, not just the district of Muskoka. Um, and, and it will start as a grassroots. It's been done before, um, but that's, that, that's, a, that's a start um, and, and, and really getting the education level. Um, we're all in this together and it's all sectors together. Uh, great, great answer, uh, Kevin. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to take a, a crack at um, what we can do to propel these messages moving forward to stimulate change? I think that's a really good answer. I mean, it starts with education. It starts with, with groups like this. And it starts with helping your neighbor know and, and your family. So that's great. Okay, we'll move on. Um, let's see, next question in line there. A few municipalities have proposed regulations to establish and protect buffer zones. This leads to an outcry from some who claim their freedoms are being taken away and they throw up roadblocks such as it provides a home for ticks and poison ivy and our water quality is great, so why change anything? People seem to want to wait until serious harm done to the, to the ecosystem before acting. Um, all advice you can offer around that and around buffers is welcome. And so I would open that to the floor. I think um, 
I think Rebecca touched on a few really important notes there around those buffer zones and around natural shorelines, but I do see Kevin Trimble has turned his camera back on. <laughs> I'm just trying to get a handle. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll have something to say about it. I'm, I'm just get, making a, sure I have a handle on the, at least to outcry, uh, roadblocks, it provides a home for two. <clears throat> Oh, I just lost the question. It, it scrolled away from me on my, oh, there it is. <clears throat> I'll, um, you know what, Kevin, I'll, I'll propose a uh, question to uh, to Graham Good while you give that some thought and you can maybe jump on right after. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, for Mr. Good, uh, is there a way we can track damage to roads or closed roads due to flooding with the geo hub? Another great question. Did we did we just put these in um, in advance or uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Yes, the GeoHub does show the roads that are closed due to flooding. I didn't didn't take the time to look at it uh, during today's demonstration, but if you go to the flood line and lidar mapping, you'll be able to see roads that have been previously closed, um, and we will keep up those up to date where we get the information from the area municipalities who monitor those roads. So. Yes, we hopefully keep a, a long-term database of which roads do get closed due to flooding. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. All right. Um, I see Kevin Trimble again. Yeah, I can I can come in and take a, that, that. That's it's, it's a great question, and unfortunately, it, it's it's a fairly big um, big subject. But I, I think if, if you're talking about lake lakeshore buffer zones. Um, I think we have to remember that we're, we're all, we're all um, up here at, uh, for um, our, own, our own reasons. And one, one of the big ones in the Muskoka River watershed is that it's a, it's a world-class environment um, that people come to, and that has generated an entire economy around it. And we're, we're very, uh, we're probably, it's probably one of the best examples in all of Ontario where the um, environment is so closely tied to our economy and, and our livelihoods and our well-being as, as a cluster of communities. And to, to maintain that, we have to get more proactive and we have to, we have to look at what we need to, to keep um, as in this case, the lake ecosystems at their highest quality. They might be great right now, um, but as I said before, there's an awful lot of different kinds of pressure coming and there are tipping points. If we just assume we can keep doing things the same as we've always done them, sooner or later, it's gonna, it's gonna bite us when we look at all of the different effects that will happen. So getting proactive and planning ahead for um, little changes we need to make in the, in the way we do things, um, will still allow the economy to thrive while at the same time giving us the sustainability we need. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, and I think we got time where we have a, a hard cutoff at about 6.25. So uh, maybe we'll just get one or two more questions in. So uh, for the group, how important are beavers to the watershed? What protections are in place for cottagers who without consultation hire trappers to kill the animals on the lakes? Sorry, and that's what protections are in place from cottagers, not for cottagers. Um, my mistake. Um, I I can't speak to uh, any any regulations or protections, but from a hydrological point of view, um, the way I see it is that uh, the beavers are creating um, uh, increased water storage over the landscape. They're you know, increasing the extent of wetlands. And overall, that slows down the amount of water that's reaching the river at any one time. So the question is, and we've actually had this question bounced around in the, in the Watershed Council a few times, um, you know, how, many, how many beaver ponds would you need to reduce a flood peak? Does it even make a difference? Uh, we don't know the answer to that right now, but we're, we're trying to come up with ways of figuring that out. Thanks. Excellent uh, answer, Dr. Lambers. Thank you very much. And maybe this will be the, uh, maybe one more, but I'll, I'll turn this one to, uh, actually to Rebecca. Um, what about boat weight damaging the littoral zone? Boat manufacturers need to be included in conversations about shorelines. Um, 
Rebecca, do you have any comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, boat, boat um, stirring up sediment from propellers is, is always an issue. Um, what that can do is it can resuspend sediment into the water, so it makes the water cloudier, um, which can impact wildlife. It can also impact uh, the water's ability to absorb sunlight and may actually increase the temperature. Um, and so, so there, there's a lot of different issues that can happen when you when you stir up the sediment in the littoral zone. Um, it's it's definitely would be nice if boat manufacturers. I mean, it, honestly, it's it's probably more up to the people who operate boats, right? So, um, Watershed Council has a brochure on watching your wake, um, and in it, it's you know you're you're not allowed to go very fast when you're within a certain distance of shoreline. So it's ensuring that, um, you know, people follow those regulations um, and, and stay out of the sensitive uh, habitat is, is really the way to go, I think, for that. Um, as opposed to trying to get manufacturers to change um, what they're building, we need to get people to, to alter how they're using the products. Great response. Thanks very much, Rebecca. And we'll do one more question. I know we have other groups like Safe Quiet Lakes in the Muskoka area and other people that are advocating on behalf of um, keeping weight down. But um, I suppose, and maybe I'll, I'll, this is from Gary Donald, um, are older septic systems a concern in Muskoka Lakes? Um, how are they monitored? I'm not sure if we have that information on this call, but maybe I'd say, are older septic systems a concern um, on Muskoka Lakes? And, and why are they a concern, um, just in case we don't actually have the information on how they're monitored. And I'll put that to our panelists. So. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know much about this, but I, I have seen uh, science, scientific papers out there uh, expressing that there is a problem with older septic systems. This is um, in the Northeast US, for instance. Uh, and the problem is that a lot of, a lot of uh, nitrogen uh, ends up getting into the waterways, which then creates problems downstream. So I would, I would expect that here in Muskoka, older septic systems would, would have a similar issue. Excellent, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lammers. And I think we're very close to uh, 624, so I will uh, turn the floor over uh, to John Miller for the, the final word. Uh, but of course, I would encourage you to come back at this time next week and every week until sort of the end of May uh, for more speaker series. Uh, but without further ado, I will um, turn it over uh, to John Miller. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and I'd really like to thank uh, our presenters tonight Kevin, Richard, Rebecca, and Graham for your time, for your expertise, for your presentation. Uh, it's greatly appreciated from our organization and all of our audience. I'd like to thank Kevin for, as our moderator and Jordan Waynes and Ann Curley for their work behind the scenes. And especially to our audience for joining us, thank you. Uh, we had over 120, 130 people, I believe, on it uh, at, uh, during, the, during the, the webinar. Uh, the third event in our series is Thursday, May 6th, a week tonight, five o'clock. Please join us. As Kevin said, we welcome Aaron Rusak and Dr. Helen Field. If you'd like to watch this series again, uh, this particular webinar or any in our, in our series, a recording will be found on our website, realmuskoka.com. Uh, there was also a lot of information, a lot of websites, a lot of resources quoted tonight. Uh, I know Rebecca put uh, some links in the chat, but we'll also so take all this information and post it on our website as well, so you'll be able to see that. Um, uh, you heard our panelists, folks. Uh, get educated, get involved, do what you can do to make a difference. So thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and stay safe.